Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Michael Bryan Podcast. I'm your host, Michael A. Bryan, and joining me today, all the way from Maryland, is Mr. John Schumacher. John, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Michael. I'm so happy to have you here, John, and I am really interested and excited to dive into the conversation that we're going to be having today. But before we get there, for those of you who this is your first time joining us here on the Michael Bryan podcast, this is a podcast where I interview yoga teachers, mindfulness-based leaders, and healers from all around the world on not only how their practice has impacted their own lives, but how their practice impacts the lives of others. So if you want to continue to be a part of the momentum that we're building here on the Michael Bryan podcast, give yourself a moment go down below subscribe to the podcast here on youtube or wherever you find us on the internet and as always share this podcast with your other yoga and mindfulness based friends because more and more people around the world need to hear from these amazing teachers like mr john schumacher now john once again thank you so much for being here i am really excited to dive in and to talk with you we we've we've met a couple of times i think two or three years back to back. And I've always wanted to speak more with you and to find out more about your story. And so I'm super happy that you're willing to take time out today to have this conversation with me. Well, I'm glad to be here. Awesome. Now, John, I, well, first of all, when I said Maryland, I had to to cross my fingers a bit because I'm used to thinking of you in Bethesda. So just to give our listeners and viewers a little bit of orientation as to where Maryland is in relation to Bethesda or is Bethesda in Maryland? Bethesda is in Maryland. You might have seen lots of Bethesda stuff if you watch news because there's lots of news coming out of Washington. And a lot of the people who live in, who work in Washington are engaged in the business of Washington, uh, live in Bethesda. It's, a, it's an upscale suburban community north of Washington, D.C. Maryland is a state north of Washington, D.C. Virginia is the state of south of Washington, D.C. And Delaware, where Joe Biden is from, is way over on east of those and joins those two states or just joins Maryland. So we have what's called the DMV, Delaware, uh, Maryland, Virginia, or Delmarva. <laughs> Awesome. Well, you just gave me an entire education. I'm from the Bahamas and in the Bahamas. So you just completely gave me more information about the DMV than I've ever gotten in my entire life. So thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. All right. Now, John, I wanted to know before we dive in, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, you actually a lot of bit about yourself. Who are you? How do you come into Iyengar Yoga and what's kept you in this practice for so long? Who am I? Well, that's sort of the question, isn't it? Uh, according to Patanjali, I'm a Purusha, a divine being, uh, without any qualities or mutabilities or anything like that. So that's who I am. But my disguise at the moment is as John Schumacher, uh, who had, was raised, born in Maryland, raised in Maryland. Um, I began becoming interested in yoga at age 25, primarily for health reasons. I had no health problems, but I had an epiphany uh, whereby I realized, well, at that stage of my life, I was actually trying to establish or figure out what was really important in life. I was brought up in a, an upper middle class family uh, that had all the material uh, things that are necessary and more. Uh, and it was not a particularly happy family, actually. And so all that material well-being, I realized, was not so great for be living a happy life and deciding what's really important in life. And um, I realized that, you know, you could have all the material things you need, but if you didn't feel well, if you weren't healthy, it won't make much difference. So that was my epiphany at age 25. So I thought, well, I'll start doing something to take care of myself. And the only thing that I knew at that point was calisthenics, jumping jacks and push-ups and stuff like that. So I started doing those things. I was living in a group house at the time. And one of the members in the group house noticed that I was doing exercises and said, you might be interested in this and gave me a book. And it was Swami Vishnu Devananda's book, Complete Illustrated Book of Yoga. This was 1970. And so... Um, 
I looked at the book and it looked a whole lot more interesting than jumping jacks. So I, in the back of the book, there was a practice schedule. So I started, I started reading the book and I started following the practice schedule and I had committed myself uh, when I was doing calisthenics to an hour a day. I thought, gosh, you ought to be able to spend an hour a day to do something as important as taking care of yourself. So I did that. And so I practiced an hour a day. I practiced in the afternoon. At that time, I was working at a small private school uh, in Virginia, just across the river. I was working with uh, learning disabled and emotionally disabled kids. And so I got home before the other people in the group house did about an hour before they did. So that, that's when I took my hour. It was quiet time I could focus. And I loved it. I mean, I just started feeling better and became more mobile and became stronger and slept better and everything started going better. And I just loved it. Uh, and so I did that. And I did that for three years and uh, still working from that book. And I was also a musician at the time. Uh, musicians are kind of like yoga teachers. Uh, some of them get really well known and are very prosperous and do well, but most of them sort of scratch along and do the best they can and get by at best. And I was that kind of musician. I was a good musician, I felt like, and the people I were playing with was, were good, but we were scratching by and uh, doing the best we could. And so uh, I had this job at the school, which I eventually quit to do music full time. Uh, and uh, one of the people that I was playing music with knew somebody who had run yoga classes for a while and stopped and then wanted to start them up again. So she mentioned to him that she, this was person in the band, that uh, she knew somebody who was uh, practicing yoga uh, and would, uh, he said, would you, well, ask him if he'd be interested in teaching and tell him that I'll come out and check him out to see if he's qualified to teach. So I said, well, sure, you know, I, I've never, I'd never had a class. And so I said, but yeah, I, would, I was also, uh, since I was making very little money as a musician, I would occasionally art model and uh, for drawing classes and sculpture classes at University of Maryland and American University and private studios and places like that. Uh, so I was making $4 an hour. Remember this is 1975 now, 73. I was making $4 an hour and this guy promised to pay me $8 an hour to teach yoga. So I said, well, sure, let him come out and see uh, you know, if I'm suitable. I practiced diligently for uh, three years at that point and I could put my feet behind my head and I could stand on my hands. And so I could do stuff. Uh, and he came out and he said, oh, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Uh, here's the program that we teach. This was an organization called the Yoga Institute of Washington. And it had been started by an Indian gentleman, Dr. Pulgenda Sinha, uh, many years earlier. And there was never any facility. There was never a studio or a center. Uh, what they had done is he had established a program and sold the program, the idea of the program, to the various recreational departments surrounding the D.C. area in Maryland and in Virginia, uh, and then had gotten teachers to teach his program. Uh, then he had left, and the two American gentlemen that he had left it with sort of let it fall apart, actually. And so they, this was one gentleman, one of the guys was cranking it back up again. And so he gave me this program, which was a 10 week program. And I looked at it and it was fairly simple and straightforward. The postures were very basic postures. You held them for six seconds. Uh, and uh, each week there was a lecture of some sort of practice. There was a cleanliness lecture where I, whereby I urged people to bathe with chickpea flour. And there was a meditation practice. So I told them you know, what the meditation practice was. And so I did that. And I, in my teacher training, this is so horrifying. <laughs> this, is the, this is the kind of stuff that if people tell me this, if these one month teacher training programs, which I rail against, if you can't, <laughs> uh, was two visits from him for a couple hours in the afternoon during the summer. And then that September I started teaching. Uh, the first teaching gig I had was in Montgomery County, which is where I live uh, at the, at a rec, rec department class with 31 people in it. Uh, and that's it, I started teaching. <clears throat> but what happened was once I started teaching, 
I said, golly, you know, I do know more than they, and I can do a lot more than they, but I really don't know that much. And so I had better uh, start studying. So there weren't very many yoga classes around in those days. I was able to t attend a weekend with Swami Vishnu Devananda in Pennsylvania, which is the state north of Maryland, uh, and did a few workshops and found an occasional teacher or two. Uh, to sort of study with. But somebody at one point gave me uh, B.K.S. Iyengar's book, Light on Yoga. And I looked at that and I compared that with Complete Illustrated Book of Yoga. And I thought, whoa, well, there's a whole lot more in here. And so I said, I'll start practicing from the practice schedule in the back of that book, like I did with the first book. Well, I, you know, as I said, I could do these sort of difficult looking poses. And I looked at the book and uh, I thought, well, I'll start with course three because I could already do this stuff. And I did a week or so of course three, the very first uh, session in course three. And I said, better start with course two. <laughs> and I did a week of that. And then I said, I, you know, I'm going to start from the very beginning. And so I started to work my way through the back of the book. And I spent the next five years doing that. And then I, you know, took some more classes and found an occasional teacher and did workshops. Uh, and um, in 1980, those five years of working with the book, I took a two week intensive in Cambridge, Massachusetts with uh, Victor Von Koten. Uh, Victor Von Koten was at, at that time was a most senior Iyengar teacher uh, and some friends that I knew at that point said, you have to go study with him if you really want to understand Iyengar yoga or get a better idea of it. I did that. I did that for those two weeks. Um, and Victor is really a remarkable person. I mean, he's just, a remarkable person. He uh, was a fabulous practitioner at that time, uh, a wonderful teacher, skillful, compassionate. He adjusted everybody in the room in every pose practically. There were about 50 people in the room. Um, he had a fabulous sense of humor. He was personable. I just fell in love with Victor. Uh, and I had not really been that interested in going to see BKS Iyengar. I knew of him, obviously, from the book. And Yoga Journal had him on the cover periodically. And he was the lion of Pune. Uh, and, you know, I had hair um, down to my waist and back and a beard down to my breastbone. And I was, you know, I was a hippie and love and peace. And yoga was love and peace. And the lion of Pune didn't sound like love and peace to me. So I loved the book, but I had no interest in going to see B, interest in going to see BKS Iyengar. Well, after studying with Victor, and people told me he's like a son to Mr. Iyengar, they're that close. I thought, you know, for somebody this remarkable and wonderful to be that close to BKS Iyengar, there has to be more to it than what I'm reading about and what I'm hearing about. So this was just about the time when you could write a letter directly to BKS Iyengar and say, I'd like to come study with you, which I did. And he wrote me back uh, and uh, he said, you can come in January, there's an intensive, make your own arrangements, send $250. Uh, so I did that and I went in January and I, that was my beginnings of studying with BKS Angar. that was 1981. And I studied with him until he died. That's an incredible story, John. And I know that there is another part of the story that you haven't gotten to yet. And I'm not going to tell you which part it is because I'm going to let you say that yourself. But what I am deeply curious to know is where did the showering with chickpea flour come from? <laughs> you know, I have no idea. That was in the sheet of paper that he handed me, which was like week three of this 10 week course. And so I, you know, had sufficient integrity to bathe with chickpea flour for a while before I did it. It's abrasive, it cleans you off, you know, it's like a really rough kind of soap in a way. And it's of course all natural. Um, so that was it. I've never heard of that again, frankly, uh, but there you go. <laughs> okay, great. Now, John, tell us a little bit about what that experience was in January, 1981, where you went to go and study with the Lion of Pune. What was your experience in Pune like? Well, I, I went by myself. Uh, I, I didn't know anybody. Um, I, it turns out I, one person uh, was there that I had met before. Actually, two people that I had met before. Uh, and um, so I was, I, I went away to boarding school as a kid a lot. Five, six, uh, how many years? Five years in boarding school. 
Uh, and so I had experienced homesickness. I was young, I was fifth grade, third grade actually when I first went. Uh, and so I'd had homesickness and that sort of feeling, but I'd never had anything like that since then. I felt homesick in Pune, which was really strange for me. Um, and uh, I was struck by the, just the difference of India. You know, I got off the plane in, it was in Bombay, in Bombay, three o'clock in the morning, flights always seemed to arrive at three o'clock in the morning. And the first thing that struck me was the smell. It was just a remarkable smell as I got off the plane and it was sort of um, diesel, diesel fuel and wood smoke and feces. That was the smell. Uh, and it was this very sort of mix and it just was uh, put me in a, in a very different kind of headspace. Uh, and um, the colors, the sights, the sounds, it was just so foreign and alien to me that I was really kind of uh, out of balance. I stayed in, um, I was gonna stay in, uh, it was Bombay then in Mumbai for three days and then go to the beginning of the intensive in Pune. I had a reservation at a hotel. I went early. I had no, I didn't know anybody in, in Bombay and in Mumbai and had no particular place to stay and felt so out of place that I thought, well, I'll just go down there and get settled in. So I went down, I got settled in. I went to class the first day. I happened to run into the one person that, uh, uh, one of the two people I knew there, uh, Marion Garfinkel. She has since passed away just recently. Uh, and um, she saw me walking up the street with my sheepskin under my arm. Because, you know, I, the, all the yoga books that I had read say you're supposed to practice on a tiger skin or a deer skin. And I didn't have either one. So I had gone to Pier 1 Imports and bought a sheepskin to practice on. And that is what I practiced on for all those years. And so um, she said, no, 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 take your, take your sheepskin. Take it back to the hotel. Just come. Uh, so she saved me probably. I don't know what would have happened if I'd showed up with my sheepskin. So I walked in and I began saying, no, he wasn't there. I was sitting in the room. As I say, at that point, it was about 30 people, 35 people was, that was the class. Uh, and I'm standing around and looking at people and looking around the room. Uh, and all of a sudden, the air in the room changed. The whole atmosphere in the room changed. And I turned around and BKS Angar had walked in the door. And you could feel his presence in the room. And he was shorter than I thought he was going to be. He looks huge in the book, not that tall <laughs> physically. But in terms of his presence, he's gigantic. So I walked in the room and he said, come on, all of you. And he got us to stand in Taras. And we didn't do no chanting back then, no invocation. Uh, and he, he walked around and put each of us, there are lines around the platform, it's taped on the floor, and he put each of us on a line. And that was our place. That's where we were going to be for the next three weeks. It was a three-week intensive. Uh, and so for the next week and a half, he paid no attention to me whatsoever. I mean, you know, he would glance at me, I would do the poses, but he was walking around, he would have people demonstrate and show people, show different things on different people. And then I'm doing Utita Hasta Parangustas, and that's a pose where you stand on one leg and put your foot up on a support or balance, this was on a support on the wall, uh, and stand there, and he gives you instructions. And so I'm standing there, and he comes up, um, and he gives me up on my shoulder and says, look at this fellow. He thinks he's so great standing here with his foot up on the wall. Have you ever thought about this? What are you doing here? What's happening there on my shoulder? You have to observe. You have to, you know. And from then on for the next week and a half, he was on me. Another person had, had said this uh, expression to me about watch out when you go to Pune. Don't do this or he'll be on you like a terrier on a rat. <laughs> he was on me like a terrier on a rat for the next week and a half. Merciless. Endless. We'd sit in the afternoon for pranayama. I'd be sitting there, sitting there, ready to do pranayama, and he'd come up, and I'd feel this wham in my back, and kick <laughs> my back, and he'd say, "Relax." <laughs> um, so that went on for a week and a half. Um, by the middle, by the middle of the first week, when he really started to get on me, and from there on out, I felt like sort of a like a prisoner in the prison, waiting for my sentence to be up. I would. Uh, do class in the morning, 
well, actually, before I would do class in the morning, I just was terrified is too strong a word, but I was nervous. Um, and I would go, okay, and I'd do the class. And after the class, I felt fabulous. I, you know, because you've it just, you felt fabulous after any great Iyengar class, but especially BKS Iyengar. And I would go take a nap in the afternoon, then I would go to do pranayama in the afternoon, and I would go back to my hotel, and I would sit up on the roof of the hotel, which could do that, and it was sunset, and there's pollution in the air, which made the sunsets extremely beautiful, all different <laughs> colors, and the breeze is going through the palm trees, and parrots are flying over, and I was ready to spend the rest of my life in India, in Pune. Then I would go to sleep and I would wake up in the morning. It was class with BKS Iyengar and I would scratch a day off. And I would, it, so I was like an emotional seesaw, up and down, a yo-yo, a roller coaster. By the end of the three weeks, I had planned to spend another week in uh, India and go to Goa and go smoke hash on the beach. That's what I was going to do and hang out. I was shot. I canceled my trip to Goa. I canceled the reservations. I made a new flight home. I went home on the day after the three weeks were over. And I said, okay, I did it. I went to India. I can put, I studied with BKS Iyengar on my yoga resume. Great. That was it. Well, I practiced every day. I was, I just always practiced every day. So I began to practice what I had learned from him. And I'd been teaching for, at that point, eight years. And I'd always taught what I practiced. And so now I began to practice, to teach what I had learned in Pune after I practiced it and began to understand it, I began to teach that. And as I practiced, I found, you know, I really don't understand this. What did he mean by that? And although I'd sworn I was not going back, six months later, I start to write a letter do you know what automatic right? You might know what automatic yes. writing. Yeah, not everybody does. So it was like automatic writing. No, no, but I'm writing this letter to go back to Pune. And he took me back. And I went back the following year. Uh, it was a year and a half from, from my first trip to my second trip. Um, and it was an entirely different experience. And I think it was an entirely different experience now in retrospect, uh, having taught for decades and decades now, as a teacher, probably the most wonderful thing a teacher can experience is the student who is eager, keen, responsive, capable, grows with the teachings. And I had worked for a year and a half from the time I had been with him diligently, uh, and he could see that in the year and a half that I, that I went back. And I was fairly recognizable because of all my hair and beard, you know, I sort of stood out. Uh, uh, he, would, he would have recognized me anyway because he recognizes everything. His memory was astonishing. He, people he wouldn't see for three or four years, he would say, now, how is your spine at this point? You know, and it's just like that. Uh, and so <clears throat> he treated me very, really differently. Uh, he, he still gave me a swat every now and then, but uh, he would look, I could see him watching me as we did the poses, watching, he, everybody felt like he was watching them in every pose. He had that gift, that skill. Uh, so uh, he would twinkle at me when I got things right. He would sort of make a face when I didn't get things right or give me a swat. And so that was the beginning of my feeling close to BKS Iyengar and actually loving BKS Iyengar uh, and forming a real bond, uh, a devotional bond of student and teacher. That was definitely the other portion of the story that I was, I was waiting to hear. Not the entire thing, because I heard some things in there that I didn't know before, but definitely the sheepskin portion, because I had heard you speak about the sheepskin several times, and I'm honored to now be a part of the sheepskin lineage. Well, <laughs> for what it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> now, John, you have studied and have taught Iyengar yoga consistently since that time. And you started off with studying this, the work of Shivananda yoga. He it is. Right, right, right. So for you, what was it like to make that transition from that in terms of a teaching style or in terms of a teaching tradition into teaching purely Iyengar yoga? 
Um, it was n not a difficult transition on one level. I mean, when I started to work from Light on Yoga, I felt like I was making much more progress in my practice. It was a much more intense practice. And so I got the benefits of that, uh, mobility, uh, stability, um, strength, focus, clarity, those sorts of things begin to uh, come better. Um, and when I, after I went to India the first time and, and began to practice that way, uh, again, the practice came to me. It made so much more sense. In fact, uh, after that first workshop with um, Victor, I felt like I, I, I realized even though I could do some, some difficult poses from working with the book for five years, that I really had no idea what I was doing. I mean, the, the, I only had the instructions in the book and they're wonderful instructions, but they're bare bones. They're just the basic stuff. And when he started talking about the skin moving here and the inner thigh and the outer thigh, and at first I thought, yeah, the skin moving here and there, it's, up. it's just kind of woo woo stuff. Um, but of course it isn't. Uh, uh, but I realized that I didn't know anything. And so um, uh, it transformed my practice and it was, I wanted to do that. It wasn't like, oh gosh, you know, this is so hard to leave behind uh, the Shivananda approach. I, uh, it spoke to me. A lot of the things that I had heard in Shivananda yoga, and of course, Shivananda yoga has its obvious own, its, its own benefits and values. And I, I met wonderful people there. Um, and that's their yoga. So that's good. That's what they should be doing. Uh, but uh, it, once I started doing Iyengar yoga, I found that a lot of the things that I'd heard about in Shivananda yoga, about energy and awareness and equanimity and focus uh, came to life. They had been words before, but it's Iyengar yoga that brought that experience of energy and presence uh, to life for me. And so it was easy for me to switch into that. What was hard for me though, wasn't hard for me, but uh, as I had always taught what I practiced, I began to teach the way I was practicing once I learned Iyengar yoga. And I had been teaching Shivananda yoga essentially before that. And so people would come up and they say, how come we're not resting between poses? Why is this so hard? Uh, I lost half my students. I, I still couldn't do anything else but teach what I was practicing. So I kept going. And so I began to get new students who were more interested in practicing the way that I was teaching. And so then that all built up and I wound up with lots more students that way for a variety of reasons uh, than I had had in Shivananda yoga. So the transition uh, wasn't hard on that level and it was only hard physically just because it was more demanding, but not, there was no resistance to it. It was just more demanding, that's all. I was speaking with Jackie that uh, two weeks ago who felt the same way that she started uh, studying with Indra Devi and doing the Indra Devi style of yoga and then Kripalu yoga. And then when she switched over to Iyengar yoga, as soon as she told them, she said, I told the students to tighten their kneecaps and they all tightened their kneecaps and they walked out the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. and, and so I find it interesting that and for me as as well, I had I had been teaching yoga long before I met Lois. And so I, I met Lois, my teacher, with this previous yoga teaching and certification and backgrounds and all of that stuff. And when I came back home to Nassau and started to implement some of the things that I was learning from Lois, I lost half of my student population as well because people were more interested in what I was doing before versus now the Sayangar yoga, it, it really is one of a kind. And the, the languaging and this inner life of Iyengar yoga that we receive through the clarity of Mr. Iyengar, it, it's really something truly extraordinary that can't be replicated. But if you're not used to that, it can feel like a bit of a culture shock. Oh, totally. It's, uh, it's up upended a lot of what I had been teaching up until that time. Plus, it's challenging. And the methodology, and like so many people, you know, I came back and tried to be a little Iyengar, you know, <laughs> hollering and shouting. And I even give people an occasional swat back in those days. <laughs> uh, uh, and so, of course, that put people off as well. 
Um, but still, even today, I'm, you know, I'm much, I think I'm much gentler, uh, much sweeter, uh, much less confrontational. You know, one of the things that I realized over the years was that uh, I used to treat my students as if they were like me, that this was their life yoga was, and that they really wanted to progress. And so I was gonna make them progress. <laughs> uh, and people are, some people, they come to class for all kinds of reasons, as you know. Uh, they come to study yoga, but they come to get out of the house on Wednesday night. They come to help their bad back. They help to sleep better. All the reasons that people come to yoga. And I can't, you know, I don't feel like I can expect them to act like yoga teachers or people who have devoted their life to yoga. So I'm much less confrontational that way. Uh, and I have no idea where these people are coming from and who they are. They may have sick children at home. They may have elderly parents at home. They, all these different things, circumstances in their lives uh, that I know nothing about. So I'm there to... Um, challenge them, but challenge them in a way that awakens them to anger yoga and doesn't put them off, doesn't drive them away. Now, there are people who uh, aren't going to pay attention and are going to be casual. And now on Zoom, I just let them be. <laughs> it doesn't bother anybody else. In a classroom, th what they do influences everybody else in the classroom. So I will keep calling them to be present because um, I have to do that. Uh, otherwise, what, why am I there? Um, I will chastise them. I won't berate them, uh, but I will keep calling them back. And they'll either come back or it'll bother them enough that they'll go away. Uh, in a Zoom class, they do what they do. The higher the level of students, the more I am challenging and confrontational, although I find that it isn't really necessary anymore. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I sort of should think about that. I haven't really quite said it that way. And I have to think about why that may be. Um, uh, I, I won't speculate now and wander around about that. I'll, we'll talk again sometime and I'll think of why I'm less confrontational. But I will um, say to somebody, no, that's not what I said to do. Here's what I said to do <clears throat> and get them to do it. <clears throat> so the higher the level of students, the more challenging I am to them. I think this is a really important point that you bring up, this concept of when we start to teach people like Ingar Yoga, we... And also, I think that this has to do with the shape of what Iyengar Yoga is as well. So Iyengar Yoga, and I'm not saying that another system of yoga doesn't have the same inherent quality, but Iyengar Yoga has this all-pervasive thing that it does, where it's not just something that you do on the side, but it becomes an entire way of being present. And I've also struggled with this and uh, earlier when I, and I, I, I'm still a baby compared to your 45 years or someone else's 50 years, I'm still learning and growing and a, a child in a lot of regards. But at the same time, when I had first met Lois and came back home and said, this is what I'm teaching and this is how I'm teaching. It came across as too strong in a lot of regards because I was trying so deeply for the students to have, like you said, the experience that I was having. And I, I've seen myself grow with that concept throughout the years to realize these people, they're not coming because they want to be yogis or because they want to dedicate their lives to yoga. Some of them are just coming for a reprieve on a Wednesday night and they're willing to give as much as they can give on that Wednesday night, but they're not being asked to live a life of yoga or they're not being asked to read the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. And, and so I've softened as well around this concept of what a student should be and it, it's interesting. And then the final point that you made about the advanced students and how you're different with the advanced students than you are with other students, I think that that is also a thing because at that point they have shown dedication and commitment. But even then, are they really prepared to hold on to the practice in the way that you hold on to the practice? Or have they just shown that dedication and commitment because it's, it's given them greater freedom within their lives, but they're not actually looking to become 
uh, a convert or whatever. So I think these are really interesting things to balance within yourself as a teacher because it does impact how you present Iyengar yoga to the world. Sure, sure. And as as you know, and, uh, and all of us who teach Iyengar yoga know, um, the teaching has to be suitable for the student. Uh, and so um, the people for whom it's just, you know, one night deal and maybe to feel a little better, um, they're just coming from such a different place that to meet them, you have to meet them, the student where the student is. And that's the only way that you can take a student further along the path. Um, so it just requires different uh, approaches for different levels of students. And, and, and I, you know, realized later that the people who were coming to study in India with BKS Iyengar, they were committed people. They had dedicated their lives to this. Many of them were, had, were teaching. That was their livelihood. And so he could approach people that way. And should approach people that way. So it was different. It was it was not the right approach to emulate uh, for me for my more beginning students. Definitely, I was I was speaking with Gabriella Gibilaro a couple of weeks ago, and she made a comment that I thought was so was so interesting because it's something that I had thought about as well. And the comment was that she isn't really teaching yoga to make people physically fit. You know, she, she's not teaching yoga to be a personal trainer or to help someone get a quote unquote yoga body. She is teaching yoga as this larger field and this larger context of what we understand yoga to be. But I wonder for you within your practice where you teach so many people and you have your center in Bethesda, Unity Woods, and, and there's another location as well, yes? Well, actually I have no locations. They're all closed. I'm only online. <laughs> No, what happened, I was very fortunate in a way um, in that once the pandemic started in March, I had leases on the two studio. I had, had had three studios. I already closed the Washington DC studio sometime earlier, uh, a year earlier, maybe two years, can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, but the Arlington, the Virginia and the Maryland studios were open. Uh, and of course we couldn't have classes, but the leases were up in that March and April. So the landlord said to me, don't worry, don't pay any rent, we'll wait and see what happens. And they waited till August. And then they said, all right, we want rent. These were big studios, expensive studios, frankly. Uh, and I just couldn't sit and pay, uh, you know, a lot of money in rent with nobody in the room month after month after month. Um, so I said, we're closed. That was it. And we took everything on to, we'd already come on to Zoom by then. So uh, that's where we are at the moment. Uh, but that was not what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> right, and, and I'm definitely interested in talking to you about that as well. But the, the point that I was getting to was which sort of students, and then we'll definitely come back to the Zoom thing because I think it's definitely applicable to the times you find ourselves in. But I was going to ask you, what sort of students do you think are attracted to you because today people are doing so many different styles of yoga and there are so many approaches to yoga and there are people who are coming into yoga specifically because they want the physical workout component of yoga. So you within the context of the teaching that you do at Unity Woods, do you find that you attract a more rarefied type of student who has more I, I don't know, more idealistic goals in terms of their path with yoga as a, as a, as a path of self-awareness or, or what, what type of students would you say have been attracted to you over the years? Well, uh, your, your original question was about the wholeness of Iyengar yoga. Um, and um, we can come back to that since I'll deal with this question because it's, that's an important question also. Uh, over the years, the, the students who have been attracted to Iyengar yoga, and of course, uh, I might attract different Iyengar yoga students than Lois does, who might attract different Iyengar yoga students than Patricia does. So we're each very different persons as well. Uh, we're not cookie cutters. Uh, and so, the people that came to Unity Woods uh, over the years were a um, little older than probably the normal yoga students, uh, the, the bulk of yoga students, uh, probably uh, from mid to late 30s up to 
and beyond up into 70s. But probably the bulk of the students are 45 to 65. Okay. Um, the, the, the discipline demands attention. And so, uh, and it's, it's challenging, as I said. So uh, it tends to be people who are a little more serious, people who are a little more educated, um, people who are more interested in refinement, detail, progress, uh, people who are uh, amenable to discipline, even if they're only coming once a week in the classroom, they have to be disciplined. You know, I get people who come floating in and uh, back in live classrooms and I'd start to teach and they'd start doing something else. It, you know, that didn't happen. So either they followed along or they, you know, found something else to do for that hour and a half. Um, so it's, those are the sorts of students that we get. So I get um, 20 somethings who come to class uh, and more and more I find them more receptive to Iyengar yoga. And we can talk about why that is, I have my ideas. But in the beginning, not so much. They didn't want to stop and look. They, they wanted to move and that's totally appropriate. And I have changed my teaching in recent years to be more movement, um, not oriented, but to contain more movement, uh, particularly for the lower level classes than the, the, the studying approach, you know, come look make your inner thigh move slightly this way and then move it that way, that kind of stuff. Um, so those are the kind of students that I find, I find uh, more attractive to Iyengar yoga. And it's, uh, it's good for this area because it's an upscale area, the Washington DC area, and people are, have advanced degrees and they're interested in um, subtlety and detail and information. Now you had made a point John, to that point of the sort of students that you have attracted, and you said that you're also starting to attract, or you have seen uh, more 20 somethings being more attracted to the practice. Uh, mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Well, I think for a number of reasons. One, as I said, I've changed my approach a bit uh, so that there is more movement, less stop and look, uh, particularly in the level one, level two areas, those kind of areas, two, threes. Uh, I also think that since yoga, when I started, there wasn't any yoga around, <laughs> but now yoga is everywhere. You, I mean, you just can't avoid it. Uh, and so uh, people have been doing yoga from a young age, high school, has, it's great you know, schools have yoga. Uh, and so by the time uh, some people are 25, 26, 27, they've been doing yoga for four, five, six years and they're ripe. They've, they've been with it long enough, if they've been doing it that long, that they're ready for um, more depth, more penetration. So I think that has a lot to do with it. And this other thing that you, that you had mentioned earlier, John, in terms of the shape in which yoga is being shared in the world today. And like you said, people have far more access to yoga today. It's something that is within our culture and it's a part of the culture of young people to a large degree as well. This other point that you made about the, the month long teacher training and how that has been a vehicle really for a lot of these younger people to be involved in yoga. What impact, whether positive or not so positive, do you think that's had on, on the community? The whole yoga community in, in yeah. general? Okay. Mixed, I have to be mixed about it. Uh, for one, a month is not enough time to begin to even begin to start to begin to commence to be able to be a yoga teacher. Um, on the other hand, I started with way less than a month, <laughs> you know, a couple of lessons. But I'd practiced for three years at that point. Some people walk in the door never having done any yoga and take a month long course and they're, they're teachers. So they're not exactly comparable. Uh, one of the things about Iyengar yoga is you've got to study for at least, you've got to be involved for five years to be a certified Iyengar yoga teacher. So as, as you know, big discussion in the community, it's off-putting. You know, people, want, very few people are really gonna do that. Uh, they may go do other, get certified other ways, teach for a while and then come and do that. But uh, it's discouraging in some ways for a number of people who might otherwise get involved and start to teach and start to study more intensely um, 
so that they can um, begin to teach. They don't want to wait five years to teach. So it's an issue in the community. Uh, I, I'm still not a fan of uh, uh, 30 day teacher training programs. Um, I think that probably there should be uh, yoga intensive, yoga enhancement programs for people who are serious and want to become teachers where they don't become teachers, but they move in that direction. Uh, I don't want to get into a whole uh, this, I don't really don't want to get into a whole discussion of how to establish teacher training, assessment, certification, and all of that. Um, but I think that the problem with the 30-day teacher training programs is, and that's what the Shivananda program is. I mean, the that retreat I went to with Swami Vishnu Devananda, I was really nervous. I was teaching a little bit, uh, but I had never had any real training. And one of the first things they started talking about was people who are teaching without being certified and aren't properly trained. And I'm going, oh, oh. <laughs> well, after I'd done the, the about two thirds of the way through the weekend, maybe Sunday morning, um, one of the teachers came up to me and said, your poses are really nice. And actually my poses were a whole lot better than anybody else in the room, frankly, which I was surprised by. I thought these people were swamis and they were living the yoga life. And, um, uh, and so I was really put off by the weekend, frankly. I wasn't very uh, um, impressed with Swami Vishnu. Uh, and uh, I wasn't impressed with the teachers who were um, talking about how important it was to be certified. And it turns out they, a lot of them weren't really practicing on a regular basis. Uh, and so I was a little discouraged and um, disillusioned about that. Uh, so the whole idea of this uh, brief training period, it's a, it's a disservice to the students because the teachers can do harm uh, and they're not trained well enough to avoid doing harm in certain circumstances. So I can't, I can't be supportive of 30 day teacher training programs, but I can insist on five years to become a certified teacher either. Uh, so I think we're all in the process of trying to sort through the best way to create really good teachers that are still encouraging to those students who are um, interested enough and motivated enough to want to teach. So it's a kind of, you know, it was kind of a scattered, not very clear answer because I'm scattered, not very clear about what's really appropriate at this stage of the game. But 30 days isn't and five years is... <laughs> somewhere somewhere goldilocks is somewhere <laughs> yeah i mean and and thank you for that it's definitely something that was a deterrent to me initially when i started teaching yoga i looked at the Ingar yoga programs and i was really intimidated by the entire structure of what Ingar yoga could be and there's an ice cream truck outside. I'm, I'm going to edit this out, but there's an ice cream truck outside. Can you hear it at all? No, I don't hear it at all. But would you bring me one, please? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to talk over the ice cream truck. All right. <clears throat> but what I was saying was in the beginning, I really was intimidated by the time commitment because at that point, I had just finished university for five years of my life and it felt like getting a, a completely different bachelor's degree in something to still at the end of the day be lumped within this larger category of yoga teachers that did that didn't do the five-year thing so i was like why do i need to struggle this hard to have this distinction when the other person on the side of me hasn't or won't and is still going to be called an, a yoga teacher at the end of the day without people taking the time or doing the research to know what the difference of Iyengar yoga is versus any other yoga. So that was a, that was a major, a major bone of contention for me. And then I met Lois and she pretty much said, you know, you could do as many Iyengar yoga workshops as you like. You could take as many Iyengar yoga classes as you like, but unless you become certified, you, you won't be able to hold this information within yourself because the process of being certified, it does something to solidify your relationship to this information that just dropping into workshops doesn't do. And I thought that she was just trying to take my money initially. I thought it was a money-making scheme. Oh, I have to come to you and be certified or whatever. But in the end, I realized that there is a, a, a solidification that happens when you go through the Iyengar yoga process. And 
maybe it doesn't need to be a five-year thing, but I mean, that's a completely different topic for another day. But I, you, I think you are right. There is this discriminatory Goldilocks place in the middle where you can look at a person and know as a know within that person whether or not they're ready to move into a teaching situation. But I think, I think it's difficult to gauge that, especially now that everything is online. It, it's probably a little bit more difficult to figure out those dynamics. Yeah, well, I think the one thing that Iyengar Yoga seems to be moving toward is this mentor uh, approach. That's how I've trained all the teachers at Unity Woods. There maybe two or three have come from elsewhere, but almost all of the teachers at Unity Woods are, have been students of mine and were standout students. And so I said, would you like to apprentice? And they were eager to apprentice and they assisted, you know, observed classes, assisted in classes, taught a few poses in the classes. They learned that way. And that's really the way to learn. Uh, the teacher then can pick students who are going to be good yoga teachers. There are plenty of people who can do fancy poses who are not good yoga teachers. And there are people who can't do whiz bang foot behind your head poses, but are sharp, observant, compassionate, intelligent, caring. That'll be fabulous yoga teachers. And so the teacher can, the teacher can see that in the student, in the apprentice, in the mentee, if there's such a word really. Mm -hmm. um, that's the way it should go. That's the best way. And of course, so many studios, back when there were studios open, so many studios survived on their teacher training programs. It was a money-making racket. And I'm not saying they were, you know, go, ha, 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 and they weren't teaching <laughs> yoga, but it was a money-making scheme. And if you took their teacher trainings away, they would fold up. Uh, and I don't think that's appropriate either. Wow. That is definitely the truth. And I, I wonder when the shift in that occurred, because one would think that the studio would want to develop more of a student population as opposed to a teaching population. But you are right, like most yoga studios that I'm aware of that are non Iyengar studios, they live and they, and they thrive on hosting these teacher trainings because it's this massive injection of $3,500 times 30 one time. And so it, it does allow them to have stability, but I, I have wondered over the years, what happens when everyone's a yoga teacher? <laughs> well, um, I don't think that many people actually become yoga teachers once they finish those programs. And some people go to them without intending to be yoga teachers. They're just interested and want to learn more. Uh, so there's that part of it. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know <laughs> what happens when everybody's a yoga teacher. Uh, maybe just like me, putting themselves in front of a class will spur them to take it more seriously and go further with it and more depth. And, you know, I'm sitting here saying they're not taking it that seriously. And somebody like BKS and Iyengar sits over there and he says, this guy is not taking it that seriously because relative to him, I'm not. So uh, it all depends on your perspective on a certain level. Now, on this note of seriousness, John, you had mentioned before this arc between you really trying to be a tiny BKS Iyengar to softening that approach a bit to now on Zoom, it's a completely different version of John Schumacher. Can you talk to us a bit about what was going on within yourself through those years of transforming and coming more into your own self to now how you're teaching today in this virtual context. Right. Um, and I've watched this, this process occur with a lot of my colleagues uh, as well. Um, it's, I think, understandable, certainly, and maybe even appropriate to a certain extent uh, in the beginning for the for this student to emulate the teacher in practice. And then when the student becomes a teacher, if the student becomes a teacher, to emulate the teacher in that respect also. Uh, but you find, I found, that I didn't live in India. So my students were different. Um, uh, my students weren't teachers or teacher wannabes. Um, so they were different. Uh, and I, begin to find my own voice. Uh, the ways that I find to describe what I want to convey to the student 
in the beginning were um, based on what BKS Iyengar said. I tried to use his language, his words, uh, his approach. I tried my best. <laughs> uh, he wasn't always happy, but um, that's who I, uh, I tried to copy. Uh, but then I found that um, I began to have my own understanding of things and I began to have confidence in my own understanding of things and find ways that the ways that I was speaking to students that didn't work for whatever reason, find other ways to speak to them that did work, that did convey what I wanted to convey, that, had, that made them respond in a way that indicated to me that they were catching something, getting something. Uh, and so over time, I developed my own voice, my own way of speaking, my own techniques, my own methods, all the more senior teachers have done that at this point. And I think that's, that's an essential thing to do. Uh, transitioning from being in a classroom with students to being online was a little tricky. You know, I've done stuff on, uh, I've done interviews and taught in front of cameras before, uh, done photo shoots, you know, been in that kind of um, milieu. Uh, and so I wasn't completely put off sitting and I was a musician. I was in yoga, in music studios and doing recordings and things like that. So that's sort of um, not being really physically in contact with somebody, but being virtually in contact with somebody was not that alien to me. But I found that I had to refine my language had to be much more descriptive. I couldn't say, do this, move that there. What's that? Where's there? Uh, I had to find, uh, be much more precise and descriptive in my language, which is a good thing. <clears throat> and uh, I couldn't uh, rely on um, presence. Um, I mean, a teacher's presence, I, I was taking, uh, I studied with Donna Holloman. That's where I met Gabriella. We both spent a lot of time with Donna Holloman. Uh, and she used to, Donna used to come to the United States and uh, first, first she started teaching in Cambridge and um, Patricia and Gabriella and a guy named Victor Oppenheimer, whose house we would all practice in and Donna would practice every morning together. Uh, and so I went to a workshop one time uh, with Donna. Uh, this was actually, well, it was after I started to practice with her. And she, somebody at the beginning of the class said, you know, you said yesterday to turn the knee this way in this pose. And uh, what did you, what exactly did you mean? And she said, points, points, points. You people, all you get interested in are points and details and stuff. That isn't what that's, that's not what it's really about. And that's not really why you're here with me. You're here with me. I do have this information, but you're here with me because of who I am and what my presence is. And uh, I came to understand what that really meant. And it's really true. And it's, you know, it's what I felt when BKS Iyengar walked in the room that first time, that presence. And that presence was the result of decades and decades of intense, deep, devoted yoga practice. <clears throat> and so that's really what the teacher brings to the class that's of utmost value. Information you can get out of books. It is that very presence that is derived from the intensity and the length uh, and the sincerity of one's practice that really transforms the students. The information is a vehicle. The asanas are a vehicle. Uh, and so how to have that on Zoom is a little tricky. And there is a way I can now feel the students better than I could when I first started. And I think I can project myself, uh, my presence a little better uh, than when I first started to teach on Zoom. And I, if you ask me, how do you do that? I'm not sure I could tell you, uh, uh, but I, I think that that's what's happening. Uh, and so like anything, the, the ability to teach on, online now, uh, I've improved just because I've been doing more of it. I've had a lot more practice with it and I keep finding ways to um, make it better, or at least I hope so, I'm trying to. I think that's such a powerful point that you brought up the point about presence and how Iyengar yoga is this system that contains this clarity in terms of asana and this clarity in terms of how we teach and what we say. But at the end of the day, there's this non-tangible factor within Iyengar yoga that is this, this living spirit, this presence of Iyengar yoga and that is the real reason why we stay coming to the practice. And there's a quote 
that comes from a teacher who I love, a philosopher, Manly P. Hall. And he says, if you want to be good at science, you read a book. But if you want to advance in your spiritual practice, you cannot storm the gates of heaven. And when I practice Iyengar yoga, I feel that very deeply within myself, the sense of there is there's something else here that I would never have gotten if I had just stuck with Light on Yoga, the book. I mean, it's a wonderful book. And as Mr. Iyengar says, a good book is better than a bad teacher. But at the same time, there's this, this living, non-tangible reality in Iyengar yoga that I think so many of us have found in the system. And I found it interesting that in the beginning of the Zoom situation, it was difficult to gauge as a teacher whether or not the students were receiving that non-tangible presence. But now, a year later, it's, it's clear and it's evident which students have really gotten that light within themselves. And that this magic by Angar Yoga, this presence, this, this light on yoga is transferable through Zoom. Yep, it is. Uh, and uh, and there, are, there are people who um, might catch it, would definitely catch it better in person and won't catch it on Zoom. And there, I don't think there are any people who catch it on Zoom who wouldn't catch it in person. <laughs> I think in person is always going to be better um, for so many different reasons. Um, but yes, that, and, and of course, it was Victor's presence that led me to write to BKS Iyengar. And in a way, it was BKS Iyengar's presence that led me to write to go back again after I'd been there the first time. I was captured. Uh, so yes, it's, it's that. Um, and it's why, it's why another reason why I think the whole mentorship, apprenticeship sort of thing is so important because that kind of in-depth isness, if you will, uh, that exists in that sign of circumstance forms the basis uh, for the whole relationship and what comes from that relationship. How do you think we can cultivate that today, given the circumstances that we find ourselves in, which hopefully there are circumstances that are going to change in the not too distant future, but this concept of, of mentorship, which can't really be replicated because all of us are teaching from home, how do you think we can create that thing that is also a beautiful part of Iyengar yoga within this virtual context? Well, I'm still doing it. I still have apprentices uh, who observe the class. Um, I have a, an apprentice meeting each, uh, before each class. I don't have apprentices in all the classes, but uh, for the classes where I have apprentices, uh, they, we meet for a half hour before the class begins uh, and we go over the preceding class from the week before. I have a class right after that class. It'd be best right after the class they're observing or participating in in some fashion if we could talk about it then. But I have another class, so I have to wait. And then the next week we go over that class and they have questions, they have observations. Um, and so uh, we talk about that. And then with the time that we have left, I have them write papers, just like the um, syllabus used to have people do. Uh, I ask them questions. We talk about sutras. <clears throat> I give them an opportunity to ask questions about their practice, uh, about what they're reading about in the sutras. So there is still this uh, forum for exchange, for presence, for learning, for exploration, uh, for feedback. Uh, so I think that's still possible. Uh, I find that they have lots less questions because when we were doing live classes, uh, the way I had apprentices work is for the first three months, they would come in and they would put their back against the wall, sit on the floor, and that's it. They didn't talk, they didn't move, they just watched. And then for the next three months, they could get up and walk around. And then for the next three months, they could bring a pillow, bring a strap, bring a brick. And then for the for the end of that year, the final three months of that year, uh, they could begin starting to do adjustments. Okay. And particularly once they start, and then there was another uh, six months after that. Uh, and, and then sometimes it went on for years and years. I have people who have apprenticed with me for 20 years. Uh, and as they begin to have opportunities to teach in the class more or to do adjustment with people or, hey, this person has a hip problem. They can't do this. Uh, Fred, you go over there, take them over there, have them do this asana, that asana, this asana. Uh, then there was a lot more opportunity to learn 
and to learn different things other than just sequences and directions and asanas. Um, so it's still limited by Zoom, but still it's possible on Zoom. A very good friend of mine, Santiago, Santiago Hernandez is one of your apprentices. And he, he told me about that process and I completely loved it because it sounds like being held in a larger bubble that's a protective space because when you get to grow like that it allows you to feel as if you're really you as if you really matter to the person who's mentoring you but also as if you're really learning within a safe space that allows you to grow safely as a teacher yeah one of the ways that i that i decide who's going to be apprentice and who isn't because i have a waiting list um uh, and is first they you know i watch them as a student and they have to be, there has to be something um, dynamic, uh, vi uh, vital about their, uh, their asana, their practice. Don't necessarily have to do great poses, you know, they don't necessarily have to do fancy poses, but they have to do intelligent, integrated uh, poses. They have to understand what they're doing and it has to be evidence in their poses. So there's that. Uh, they have to be quick. Um, it's a whole story about Iyengar and horses and donkeys and you know all that stuff. So they have to be, they have to be horses. They have to be quick. Um, they have to be intelligent and they have to be articulate. And I find this out by talking to them after class, uh, getting a sense of who they are. Uh, and then um, if, if I feel like they have those qualities, uh, then I have to sit, bring them in and sit down and talk with them and say, you know, you asked to be apprentice and um, I, I'm, interested in, I'm interested in your being an apprentice also and you have these qualities uh, that are important because I can teach them information about the asanas and how to, how to teach techniques for teaching, how to do sequencing, but I, I can't teach articulateness, compassion, um, uh, wisdom, those sorts of things, that, that has to be there. Uh, so they have those qualities and I say, here's the way this is gonna work is um, we have to be able to talk to each other, frankly. We have to be able to talk about anything at all because as a teacher, uh, you're gonna encounter everything. Because as a teacher, we encounter everything. People's problems, their successes, their failures, their, all their, their lives. Uh, as they become students and stay students, their lives unfold before us uh, over periods of time. Uh, and so you have to be able to talk about anything um, just that. There has to be that frankness and openness in the discussion. And if I don't feel like I can have that with somebody, I don't care how skillful and artic articulate and intelligent they are, I can't be their mentor. Somebody else could be, but I can't be. So I have that relationship with all the people who have uh, apprenticed with me. Uh, speaking of Santiago, I was really sad that, uh, I'm happy for him, but sad he went off to New York. But now, Zoom, now he can teach at Unity Woods, which he would not have been able to do. So there's silver linings in the Zoom. <laughs> he most definitely can. He, he is, he's a great person and he definitely adores you as well. Well, all, all my teachers are great people. Now, John, uh, the final thing I want to talk to you about is this thing about you that you are known for throughout the entire Iyengar Yoga <laughs> world. Which is the sheepskin? <laughs> not the sheepskin. But, I mean, the sheepskin as well. Don't get me wrong. So the sheepskin is not the thing, but also your pranayama practice, and that is something that, once again, you're you're known for, and it's something that you're admired for. And I know that even when I was at Unity Woods with Lois and after we had finished the workshop that she was teaching, we were speaking afterwards and she said, you know, John really has a great pranayama practice. He is, he is, you know, a great pranayama practitioner as well as teacher. So I want to know for you, at what point in time, because we know that Iyengar Yoga has many different parts of it. There are, there are some people who really, really get into the use of props as their thing and they become the prop technician. And then there are other people who get really into the therapy and they become the go-to person for therapy and then the asana and all of these different parts of Iyengar Yoga, which are brilliant. But what for you made pranayama such an important thing for you to focus on and to not only practice, but also teach? 
I'm not sure I can say when pranayama became so important to me. In many ways, it is the heart of my practice at this stage of my practice. Um, it just contains everything, um, as does asana. I wrote a piece for Samachar about how asana has all everything in it, those three sutras. Uh, but for me, it's pranayama. Uh, I started practicing pranayama in Shivananda tradition, which, <laughs> I mean, just like you start off doing headstand the first day you go to a Shivananda <laughs> class, wherever you fall over and you're on a piece of wood or whatever it is. So you start doing <laughs> all that stuff right away. Um, and of course, once I started doing Iyengar pranayama, I had to start completely from scratch. I mean, I realized it, it entirely different approach. <clears throat> And again, it was, you know, I had, I enjoyed the pranayama before Iyengar Yoga pranayama, but it was the Iyengar Yoga pranayama that really began to transform my pranayama practice and my understanding of what pranayama was about. Uh, certainly a, a, a milestone or a, uh, a major event with regard to my pranayama practice was the pranayama intensive that Bikes Iyengar did in 1995. He did another one a year or two later, I think the next year. Uh, but it was transformative. Uh, one of those classes uh, reduced me to tears. The experience was so profound. Uh, I went up and wept and touched his feet. I think it might've been the first time I ever touched his feet. I don't know. Um, no, I must've done it before then. But anyway, it was the depth of the experience uh, of the practice over a period of time. Uh, and the, and the, the integration of asana and pranayama is inescapable in that process, in that the subtlety that I begin to experience and practice in my practice of asana practice, turned me on to the possibility of such subtleties in pranayama and the subtleties of the breath begin to refine the subtleties of the practice in my asana practice. So they speak to one another. You can't really separate the two. Um, but it was just, I think it was, you know, <clears throat> uh, the Sutra, Sutra 14, um, um, where Satu Dirga Kalana Naryantariya Satkara Sabito Drita Bhumihi, that you have to practice for a long time uh, uh, for uh, with great devotion. Uh, that I practiced pranayama for a long time uh, with great devotion uh, and it just works. It just begins to transform you. If you do it that way, uh, it's, you, it's inescapable. You'll be transformed. And uh, vistas, not vistas, um, doors will open for you that will lead you into rooms that you didn't know existed before and lead you into states of mind that you may have had hints of, but now you begin to understand what those words, those, um, what you read, what you heard about, uh, what they really are speaking to. Um, and it is, it is that experience that I want to share with anybody that I can share it with who's, who's able, receptive and willing. Uh, and so um, what I realized was in studying pranayama, most people who have studied pranayama in the Iyengar tradition as well, they get at best once a month, you'll have uh, restorative pranayama week, you know, where you do classes, you do it for that week. Uh, and if you do asana that way, you don't really learn asana if you do it once a week or once a month or one week a month. Um, so, oh, it's probably been 25 years or so that I started a weekly pranayama class uh, for an hour, an hour long class. And you came in and it started from the very beginning. You lay down, you lie down uh, and you observe your breath. That's the first week. It's the hardest week, actually. Too bad to have to start the whole thing with the hardest week. And then step by step by step by step, based on the book, based on my own practice mostly, based on my experience in pranayama classes with the Iyengars, all of them. Um, uh, I built that course up so that by the end of the year, it was a year long course, you do three months and then you could drop out or in the next three months, the next three months, you were doing beginning digital pranayama, analomas and prachalomas you be doing a uh, beginning kumbhakas, um, retentions uh, after inhalation by and antara. Um, 
uh, because I felt that was the only way to really give people uh, an experience of what pranayama is. This once a month thing is nice. It may get them eventually to practice on their own, but doing it weekly, they knew that something was coming up, they had to prepare for. Uh, and of course, nobody was doing pranayama much back then. So I would have 10, 12 people the first three months, and then eight or nine people the second three months, and four or five people the third three months, and three or four people, maybe two or three people for the end. Uh, but over time, I would wind up with 30 or 40 people in the first, and you know, 20 people at the end who had gone through a whole year of studying pranayama. Um, so that's kind of how it's developed for me over time. But it is, you know, it, 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 it's the one thing I don't miss. You know, I may travel, but I don't travel anymore <laughs> like everybody else. Things may come up. I may miss an asana practice occasionally. I don't miss pranayama practice. I find that really interesting and, and heartfelt to hear you say that because I am desirous, and that's probably definitely not the yogic word, but I am I'm definitely wanting to establish a more consistent pranayama practice for myself. And it's something that's meaningful to my mentor, Lois as well, and it's something that she doesn't miss. She has a daily pranayama practice. And I think for me, I've been aware of the need to bring that more fully into the shape of my own practice, but I'm also aware that there's so much content within the asana practice of Iyengar yoga and then the larger philosophical backdrop upon which it's built that is like, okay, so I'm, I'm studying the Hatha Yoga Pratipika and I'm studying the asana and I'm teaching the asana as well. And so it's, it's, it, it feels like another piece. But what I'm hearing you say, which I, which I definitely admire and I want to draw from is that it is the most central piece in terms of bringing all the other pieces in. Is that correct? Uh, for me at this moment, um, and it was asana before was the central piece. And I may at some point along the way um, find that some other aspect of the practice takes me someplace um, where, where I should be and where I want to be. Uh, but right now it's pranayama because for me, of course, you're in an asana when you do pranayama. You're either in shavasana or you have some seated asana that you're in. Uh, and um, pratyahara is essential part. You have to quiet yourself down. You have to withdraw your senses. You have to, I, I hate that. You don't withdraw your senses. You redirect your senses and bring them to a quiet and relaxed place. And it turns into dharana, dhyana, samadhi, samyama. So you're doing samyama when you're really practicing uh, pranayama in great depth. So that's why it's uh, the focus of my practice and takes me to the heart of yoga, um, at, at this moment in my life. So, you know, that's, that's how it is for me. So I'm fortunate now to be able to write this column, you know, column for the Yoga Samachar uh, for the next few issues on Pranayama. I'm, I'm so happy to be able to do that because I just love sharing it with people and um, trying to talk them into doing it. Now, and a piece of advice for you <laughs> is get up, go to the bathroom and do your Pranayama. That's it, that's it. Do you have family? Uh, no, I mean, I, I have family, but I definitely live alone. Well, then in that case, I have family, you know, and, and a lot of time I had family early on. I had, my, had children early, but I spent also a lot of time living alone as well. So that's if, conducive to your practice living alone because <laughs> you just get up and do it. Uh, so that's it. If you get up and spend a half hour, you don't have to spend, you know, a long time, half hour, that's all. And you have, a, you have as good a teacher as there is. So any guidance you need, she can give you. Well, I will definitely begin that practice and I will report back. Good, good. I'll be happy to hear. Really, I would like to hear. Now, John, before we leave, there's a thing that you had mentioned earlier about wholeness in Iyengar yoga. And you just spoke about these final limbs of yoga and they're all so very important, but I, I want to know from you and just pick your brain a bit about what does this concept of wholeness within a person's yoga practice look like? What does it look like? Well, let's think about what it means first. Um, 
So, uh, what, you, you know, we have these koshas, these layers, um, the, the physical, just to, in sort of general terms, physical, energetic, mental, uh, intellectual, in terms of discrimination and spiritual. Let's describe them that way. There are lots of ways to describe them. That's all, that's who we are. We are all those different levels of being. And what I found Iyengar Yoga does, and really sincere practitioners of any of the forms of yoga to me, um, uh, incorporate this wholeness. Because you know people come to class and they want to fix their bad back. It's a physical practice for them, or they want to get stronger, or they want to have muscles or whatever. Um, but sooner or later, it begins to permeate them in a way that it begins to affect the entirety of their being. And when I'm teaching an asana class, of course, I'm teaching them movements and bodily stuff, but I'm also aware of them on all of those levels and I'm aware of addressing them on those levels. And so while I may be given, giving them instructions about their kneecaps, I'm also talking about their breath. I'm also talking about relaxing their eyes, relaxing their temples. What does that do when you relax your eyes? How does that make your brain feel? Uh, and then we go on to something else, but it's, I begin to um, insert it, weave it into uh, the basic asana practice so that it begins to incorporate not, it, it, it's inevitably going to incorporate the wholeness of their being, whether they realize it or not, or whether I express it that way or not. But to express it, to name something gives it power. And so by expressing it to them uh, and making them realize what they what's happening, uh, then they begin to experience the wholeness of the practice and understand that it is that, that it touches them on every level of their being. And so we go back to the way we started out, which is they finally begin to have a sense of their purusha, that there's something in there that's whole, incorporates all this stuff, these different koshas, sheaths, layers, but is at the core, is, is their essential being. And so what I say to people in the asana classes is, and particularly when it was live and I would go around and do more adjustments on people, is that, you know, um, some people don't like Iyengar yoga because um, we say that don't do it this way, do it another way, that there's a correct way in the moment to do this, which is the way the teacher is teaching it. There isn't any correct way. Um, but th in this moment, this is the correct way to do it. And if I say to you, you know, don't, turn your feet this way. Don't turn them that way. I'm not finding any fault with you at all. You're a divine being. You're faultless. I can't find any fault with you, but your asanas may not be so divine, may not be so perfect. And it's that that I'm dealing with. And so right from the very beginning, that was what I would say to the beginning class on the first day. And so that element of their essential nature being divine is there from the get-go. And I think that's an essential part of the yoga, and it's, Guruji taught that from the very beginning. That's a beautiful point of reflection. And the longer that I practice Iyengar yoga, the more I realize that Iyengar yoga is really a simple practice at the end of the day, if we really were to step back from it and really look at it for what it is. And what makes it appear to be complex or difficult is that there's so much of us that we have to cut through or that we have to get through in order to find that simplicity. But th there was a book that I read when I was in dance school in Jamaica and it's called The Body is a Clear Place. And as I practice Iyengar Yoga, I come back to this, this reminder that the body is really a clear place and Iyengar Yoga is a clear practice, but there's so much body that has to get cut through in order to be in that grand canyon of clarity that that is where we get this challenge from when we come to Iyengar Yoga practice. But I'm reminded of a, a quote that Mr. Iyengar made in the, in the first uh, Ashtadala Yoga Mala where he says, even if perfection eludes you, do not reduce your efforts. And to, to this end of wholeness, to this end of wholeness, I, I think that that is what Iyengar Yoga is fundamentally about. And I love the fact that that's something that you practice and that's something that you teach. And that's a place, a central place from which you operate within the world. 
Yes, and interestingly enough, going back to pranayama, there are five sutras in the middle of those, you know, eight limbs about the, um, the different limbs. Uh, and the fourth one says, tata kshiyate prakashavaranam, which means that pranayama, dissolve, the way Chayimni translates it, is dissolves the covering of light. So exactly what you were saying. We just have to get rid of, you know, we have this light that's in us, and it's like a, a light bulb hanging in a dusty basement. And it's full of cobwebs and grime and our job, the asanas, all the practices are just cleaning all that stuff off so our light shines out. John, thank you so much for, for holding space for those teachings and for that teaching and for you yourself being a point of light and clarity within the lives of so many people. Because, you know, a, a lot of our colleagues and friends in Iyengar Yoga, we, we all talk to each other and everyone who I've spoken to who's a student of yours is someone who really tries to hold on to the clarity of your own teachings within themselves and it's such a pleasure and an honor to be able to speak to you in this way and to know that that is something that you intend to do in your own teaching and practice. So thank you so much for sharing the space with me. You're so welcome, Michael. Maximum respect. Most definitely, John. Now, the final thing is for those of our listeners and viewers who want to get in contact with you, John, or who want to plug into your teachings, how can they find you online or anywhere at all? They can find me at www.unitywoods.com. They can find me uh, at schumacheryoga.com. Um, you can go to YouTube and put Schumacher, Schumacher Yoga and it'll come up. Um, I think that's how you can find it. <laughs> awesome, John. So I'll put that information down below in our description box so that our viewers and listeners can find you everywhere you are online so that they can plug into more of your practice and your teachings. Thank you so much, Michael. Pleasure to be with you today. Pleasure to have you here, John. And for those of our viewers and listeners, if this is your hundredth time joining us here on the Michael Bryan podcast, or if this is time number one, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for continuing to share in this virtual mindfulness-based space with us. I receive your love, your feedback, your encouragement, and your support. So if you want to continue to support the Michael Bryan podcast, please do, yes, like this video, as well as subscribe to the Michael Bryan podcast, as well as share this interview with your other yoga-based and mindfulness-based friends wherever they are in the world, because more and more people need to hear about these amazing conversations we're having with these amazing teachers like Mr. John Schumacher. So until next time, I'm your host, Michael A. Bryan, leaving you in peace and love and hope until we meet again. Have a good one. Bye-bye. John Schumacher. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> this time of year, I've been in Jamaica for the last 37 years. I know, I know, I know. I used to live in Jamaica and my family is from Jamaica. And so I was, I was in university in, in 2008 and I, I was doing yoga there with someone and I saw that you were coming to Jamaica and I thought it was so bizarre that you would be John Schumacher coming to Jamaica and I, I never made it down but I'm, I'm you used to go to Negril right? Always in Negril yes. <laughs>